Okay. Okay, so uh, welcome to those of you joining us uh, for this uh, speaker presentation, uh, the last speaker presentation in our uh, series on artificial intelligence and the law here at the uh, University of California Irvine School of Law uh, in the beautiful spring of 2021. Um, uh, we've had uh, a number of speakers so far touch on different areas uh, of uh, law intersecting uh, with the technology of artificial intelligence. We've had a chance to look at uh, criminal law questions, employment law questions, uh, even uh, the law of war, uh, international law. Uh, and so we're, uh, we're very pleased today to be joined by uh, Professor Margot Kaminsky, who is uh, joining us from uh, the University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, she uh, has become a leading voice in uh, law and technology, uh, in, in areas of copyright and the First Amendment and uh, pro privacy, four or five other things I'm probably forgetting, uh, but, uh, but uh, definitely uh, in the area of artificial intelligence. Uh, and so we are uh, very excited to hear her paper on authorship uh, disrupted uh, in the area of copyright and uh, First Amendment with regard to artificial intelligence. Um, after we hear from Professor Kaminsky, uh, we'll uh, uh, hear a short response, a few comments from our colleague here, uh, Professor Jack Lerner. Uh, Professor Lerner uh, uh, directs our clinic here on uh, technology uh, and intellectual property in the arts uh, and is a, a well-known expert on, on these topics of uh, copyright and the First Amendment. Uh, the clinic here does a lot of uh, work uh, in both of those areas, and so we're looking forward to his uh, take on uh, the paper. Uh, and then we will open it up for questions. Uh, you will see in this webinar format that there is a uh, Q&A channel um, that the audience can pose questions. Uh, and so after we've heard from our uh, two speakers, I will uh, moderate uh, questions uh, from the audience. Uh, and our plan is to wrap up a little before the, the hour. So this will be just about exactly an hour. A um, couple of uh, other logistical uh, announcements uh, to point out. Um, uh, for those of you who are here uh, uh, for CLE, for continuing legal education credit, this has been approved for CLE credit. Uh, and towards the end of the hour uh, in the chat uh, stream, um, you will see uh, our staff will post a uh, URL uh, that you can uh, link to in order to get the forms to get your CLE credit. Um, and, uh, and so with that, uh, I'd like to turn the uh, floor, the virtual floor, such as it is, over to Professor Kaminsky uh, to hear about authorship uh, in the areas of uh, copyright and First Amendment, uh, as that uh, tells us something about technology and about artificial intelligence. Uh, Professor Kaminsky. Thank you, Dan. Is there a way for me to pull up, uh, for you to enable screen share so I could pull up slides? Um, uh, yes, I think Aaron can do that. Uh, you should be a co-host. Is that correct? There we go. There we go. All right. So we'll have some slides. All right, so thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the chance to engage with this material. Um, I will note that Professor Burke has written a, uh, not so much response to this, but a follow on with his own thoughts. And I'm gonna try to engage with that a little bit in this presentation. Um, okay, so the premise of this article, or really this essay, was the question of whether artificially intelligent authors disrupt the law. And I put that word disrupt in quotations because Disruption is a really heated topic of conversation among those of us who work in tech policy. It comes weighted with an enormous amount of baggage. Um, largely, it gets used in regulatory conversations to talk about deregulation or foregoing regulation because technological development moves too fast for the law, allegedly. Um, and so this project was an attempt to engage with those conversations about technological determinism, technological exceptionalism, with a few examples from fields I'm very comfortable with, copyright and First Amendment law. So this bigger question behind the project then is really, what does it mean when we say that technology disrupts the law? What do we mean by that? So the premise of this, this article, uh, which is a little bit higher than um, talking about doctrinal details, though I'm hopeful that we'll get to those too, is the claim that technology doesn't just act like an outside force upon the law. The law constructs technology. 
And here I'll nod to the work of Meg Jones at Georgetown, who's also written pretty extensively against tech exceptionalism to talk about the ways in which the law is its own system of meaning and constructs technology as it encounters it. So my claim in this piece is that you can see the law playing a role in its own potential disruption. All right, so let's talk about the technology and what it is we mean when we say artificial intelligence. An AI is an algorithm that is a particular type of computer program. And I wanna start by acknowledging human roles in the development of even the most emergent forms of AI. Humans choose the objectives of these programs. They choose what to measure. They choose what data they're going to use to train the program on. They choose how to weight data points and whether and how to check for accuracy. They choose what kind of algorithm. So some types of algorithms are more transparent than others. Some are more predictable than others. And how much to delegate to the end user of the algorithm, which is also an important point when we're talking about who the author is for purposes of copyright law. Now, the thing about AI that's been identified by Ryan Kahlo and others as a particularly disruptive feature of the technology is that some forms of AI can demonstrate emergence. And by emergence, I don't mean strong AI, AI that operates entirely without human influence, but AI that is unpredictable in ways that are maybe different from other kinds of tools. Uh, although Professor Burke has written that it in some ways is very similar to different kinds of tools we already have. So some examples of this uh, with some great illustrations. Google's Deep Dream was created as a way of illustrating what a neural network or a particular type of algorithm sees when it looks at an image. Um, and what it sees is something quite hallucinogenic. Um, IAMIS is a program that composed a symphony allegedly from scratch, they're really based on data sets, that was performed several years ago by the London Symphony Orchestra. And the what-if machine is another algorithm that came up with a plot, characters, and the set for a musical that was then performed on London's West End. So one huge caveat is that AI now, as we know it, is often very strange. Uh, it is in some ways distinctly non-human. And as an illustration, I want to offer some of the neural network generated pickup lines from Janelle Shane of AI Weirdness. So she trained these, uh, these programs on data sets of internet texts and asked them to predict the content of the following article. These are the top pickup lines of 2021, amaze your crush. The first one it generated was, I have exactly four stickers. I need you to be the fifth. Then there's, you have a lovely face. Can I put it on an air freshener? Or I will briefly summarize the plot of Back to the Future 2 for you. And probably my favorite, it is urgent that you become a professional athlete. So while AI may produce things that look like sentences or produce things that look like art, it is distinct in certain ways from the way that humans parse creativity. This is the explanation, by the way, for how why Google's Deep Dream is so strange. Uh, she shows an example of a neural network looking at a painting and the network is trained to find pictures of dogs. So it dislikes the painting when it looks like the kind of painting you and I might like. But the more pictures of dogs that you put into it, the happier the AI. All right, so in practice, AI authorship, even as it exists now, constitutes a range of practices. And some of them I want to acknowledge fit very easily into existing law. That is to say, they're not disruptive of it at all. When you think of Deep Dream as being a tool akin to a paintbrush, then it's very easy to come up with decisions about who constitutes the author of the deep dream outputs. You can think of the authors of the algorithm, the more uh, input the algorithm itself provides as potential co-authors co and use joint authorship doctrine under copyright law. And so for the near future, I agree with James Grimmelman, who has posited that most questions are going to be questions of technological fact rather than technological law. We're going to try to see whether use of AI technologies looks more like using a tool or more like joint authorship or more like a work for hire. But if at some point in the future, we imagine AI that's emergent to the point where these, these analogies really stop making sense, we may have to stop placing the technology into existing buckets and level up to discussions of the theory that's behind the law. In other words, in some circumstances, as the technology involves, we may find ourselves having to ask not what is the law and which bucket does this fit into, but why do we have this law in the first place? <laughs>
So the central question of is AI authorship disruptive, when you look at it from the perspective of copyright law, which is about the ownership of created or assigning the ownership of creative works, and First Amendment law, which is about protecting free speech, appears at first to be about the question of whether either of these areas of law are focused or centered on human authors and speakers. And the paradigmatic example of the type of author or speaker that these areas of law center on is the romantic author. That is the individual human who produces creative output during moments of enlightened creativity. There's been a lot of legwork around discussing or dismantling romantic authorship in the context of copyright law. Because in reality, we know that authorship is rarely, if ever, an individual endeavor. We are all the output of our inputs. Uh, we all create things on the basis of what we have seen created before. And in some ways, copyright law is actually uniquely calibrated through fair use doctrine and other mechanisms to recognize the lack of romantic authorship. In others, however, it might be seen as being exactly about this type of author. Uh, we provide incentives for individuals. We look for an individual creator or moment of creation. And so the question from the perspective of discussions of AI is just how solidly centric is this romantic author or speaker? And does the AI author disrupt those schemes by not being human? So again, returning to the higher level claim of this paper, I believe that law makes meaning of technologies. It's a vocabulary or a system of meaning making. And that meaning making lays the groundwork for how a particular technology, or again, if we want to be really accurate, the social use of the technology, because technology never exists in isolation from social use of it, is or isn't disruptive of the law. Now, even when I wrote this paper back in, I think, 2016 or 17, there was already extensive discussion of whether AI authorship disrupts copyright law. Anne-Marie Bridey uh, of the University of Idaho and now of Google Copyright Council said that AI authorship is really a minor doctrinal disruption. All you need to do is adjust work for higher doctrine. We'll talk about that shortly in a little greater detail. And you can fold AI authorship, as some countries have done, into an existing copyright law scheme. Bruce Boyden, by contrast, contrast said this is an example of major doctrinal disruption. It forces us to think about the entire category of originality doctrine and to re-examine how copyright law has laid out its calculations of what constitutes an original work. James Grimmelman, as I mentioned earlier, says there's nothing new under the sun here. This is not disruptive at all. For purposes of applying copyright law, we look, again, not to technology law, but to technology facts. So by way of admission, the Copyright Office has already explicitly stated, in part in response to a fascinating conversation about monkeys and authorship, that works must be authored by a human being in order to be protected under copyright law. And I'd like to say, even if you are strongly focused on the doctrine, that does not need to be the end of the question. There's a substantial question about how much deference is afforded to the Copyright Office's interpretation of the law, and the Copyright Office could always change its interpretation of the law. So how do we handle copyright ownership when we're talking about AI? You could assign ownership to the programmer. You could assign ownership to the user who's using the AI as a tool. The programmer and user could be joint authors, or the work could go unowned. And so to answer these questions, we actually have to look a little bit further up in the stack of what makes copyright law copyright law. First, I look at the constitutional source of the statutory law. The progress clause does explicitly say the word authors. It gives Congress the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors the exclusive right to their respective writings, et cetera. So the Copyright Act building on this also refers to works of authorship or that are owned by the authors of a work. And the, the question here is whether the word author by itself or as instantiated in the doctrine brings in some elements of humanness. For that, we look actually again a level up into the theory behind the law. Why do we give copyright protection to creative works? The dominant theory in US law is utilitarianism. And in fact, the US Supreme Court has numerous times rejected several of the other theories that I will mention here today. The idea of the utilitarian theory of copyright law is that we aim to incentivize the production of knowledge and art for the benefit of net social welfare. Natural rights theory, by contrast, focuses on deserving the ownership right. Because of mixing one's labor, as Locke says, with the uh, available commons, we can deserve or picture the author as deserving 
some sort of intellectual property protection. And finally, a theory that's less dominant in the US, uh, though more dominant in European countries, is the moral rights or personhood theory, which argues that if you mix your selfhood with your creative works, then you own them in part because otherwise your conception of self or your personhood might be damaged by downstream use. So if you subscribe to a natural rights theory or moral rights theory of copyright, AI authorship is a poor fit. That's because AI authors don't have personhood and AI authors arguably don't labor in the way human beings labor and thus don't need to be rewarded with uh, property protection. But since utilitarianism is the backbone, the theoretical background of US copyright law, that leaves a lot more space for getting humans into the theoretical loop. A work that is authored entirely by AI, let's imagine AI Tolstoy, might benefit net social welfare as much as the work that is authored by human Tolstoy, or an op-ed that criticizes the president or some other aspect of the government that's written by an AI might benefit net social welfare as much as the same op-ed written by a human. So then the question becomes, how do we structure incentives? Would an AI need its incentives? Would its programmers? Would the human user? Thus, if copyright law is centered on the notion of the romantic author, which it arguably isn't, um, then AI would be fundamentally disruptive. Utilitarian theory by its nature is not focused on a romantic human author, where again, Lockean theory, natural rights theory, or moral rights are. Now coming back to the doctrine, despite the copyright office's pronouncement, there is space arguably in copyright doctrine for AI authors. And that space exists in the doctrinal discussion of originality and of works for hire. Both of these can be understood as applications of the question of who's an author. Originality doctrine in the context of copyright law is an extraordinarily low bar, though it has not always been the case. A work must be original to be granted protection by copyright law. And in the Supreme Court case of Feist, uh, which effectively looked at the originality of the phone book, the Supreme Court established that a mere modicum of creativity could constitute enough for something to be protected as original. Thus, this means that judges, when they're looking at works, barely assess creativity. And instead, the default is that even handwriting by itself is enough to be original. Or in Bracha, in an extraordinary work about the intellectual history behind these developments, points out that this is arguably the results of powerful economic actors in the 19th and 20th century, such as commercial publishers, textbook publishers, and advertisers, wanting copyright protection for things like advertisements and pop boiler fiction, and thus pushing back against the doctrinal consequences of romantic authorship. So work for higher doctrine exhibits a similar predilection away from romantic authorship. Under work for hire doctrine, an employer or corporation owns the work from the outset. It's assigned at its moment of creation. And this is an example that Emery Bridey highlights of a non-human author, or really a human author as automaton. Thus, Bridey arrives at her solution that we could adapt works for hire uh, uh, legisl legislatively, as other countries have done, to make room for either the AI author or assign the work to the corporation or user of the AI. Now, the takeaway from all of this in the context of copyright law is that US copyright law built on the foundation of utilitarianism has moved far enough away from the romantic author for AI authorship to potentially not be very disruptive at all. And this shift, as Bracha points out, preceded AI authorship and may even just be part of a general shift away from looking to judges to judge net social welfare uh, and instead asking judges to be more formalistically adhering to check marks in the doctrine. Thus, I argue technology is not a disruptor in this story in a conventional sense. It's not outpacing the law. It doesn't arrive on the scene of law that can't handle it. It gets folded into an existing package of doctrine and underlying theory that constructs the technology into its existing logics. And this makes salient existing features of the law, such as the low originality threshold and work made for higher doctrine. When we turn to First Amendment law as another example of this, we find that First Amendment doctrine is also surprisingly receptive to a non-human author. Whether we look at the constitutional language, the underpinning of theory, or the doctrine itself, 
Unlike the Progress Clause, the First Amendment doesn't mention authors or speakers at all. It starts from a perspective of banning Congress from making law that abridges freedom of speech. This has led to the so-called negative view of the First Amendment, which in our expanding First Amendment jurisprudence from this Supreme Court, has resulted in a case called Heffernan, where there was no speaker at all. Heffernan was picking up a political sign for his mother, and he got demoted. And the Supreme Court said that despite the fact that the government sanctioned him for speech he did not make, the First Amendment was still violated because the government's intent to censor alone was enough. Now, if we look to the theory behind the First Amendment, we again find, as my colleague Helen Norton has argued more extensively in other contexts, a large room for looking to reader side and, and audience side interests, which in some ways actually makes the humanness of the author or the speaker much less salient. Marketplace of ideas theory of the First Amendment says that more speech is better as human listeners or human readers go out into the world and try to cobble their ideas together from available speech. Democratic self-governance as a theory focuses on a particular kind of speech, speech in the fur furtherance of good citizenship. But again, you can use democratic self-governance to argue for protection of speech, even in the absence of a human speaker, because democratic related speech from an AI might still be beneficial to the citizenship efforts of individual listeners. Finally, the autonomy theory of the First Amendment, which again runs strong in US, US Jewish jurisprudence, says that the government should not restrict speech because it impinges on individual people's autonomy, except when there is a harm that very vastly and usually formalistically outweighs that speaker's autonomy. And so this one is the one that again, like moral rights doctrine or moral rights theory or personhood theory in the context of copyright law, seems to point more towards a human speaker. However, each of these theories, including autonomy theory, in fact does potentially protect AI speech or push towards protecting AI speech, as autonomy can also apply to reader and listener side interests too. That is to say, if AI Tolstoy writes an amazing novel and I as a reader go to read that novel and find that it's censored, that impinges upon my autonomy as a reader as much as it impinges on the autonomy of potentially the programmer of the AI or the AI itself. There's a different category of questions raised by AI in the context of First Amendment law too. And that's the question of whether AI speech is salient to the First Amendment. A more simplistic way of asking this is to ask, is AI speech speech at all? There have been historical shifts in a First Amendment application to different kinds of media, including to movies, where initially First Amendment doctrine found that, or really the Supreme Court found as part of First Amendment doctrine, that movies were not considered to be covered speech and later reversed this when it became apparent that most of society believed movies to be strongly expressive. But at this point in the doctrine, it's traditionally a question that we ask now, not of clearly speechy things like movies, novels, or op-ed, but of things that sit at the speech action intersection. Things like symbolic speech, like wearing a particular color t-shirt to signal affiliations or wearing armbands to protest the war. And there, doctrinally, the First Amendment has the Spence test, which asks whether to consider whether something is covered by the First Amendment or salient to the First Amendment, there has been intent to communicate a particularized message that is likely to be understood. That is intent to communicate a particularized message that's likely to be understood. Now, AI fits poorly with this particular test because we end up asking the question of what exactly constitutes intent. Right? Does Spence require a human level of intent or a human to intend things? And that could constrain application practically of the Spence doctrine to AI, though again, I think that it would not be hard to, to fiddle with the doctrine to make it easily applicable. But this really only applies when the speech action question arises and not to things like AI Tolstoy or other forms of clearly expressive acts. A recent example, or another example, of where AI speech has been debated is the conversation about regulating search engines. And there we see the conversation happening at the level of doctrinal buckets. It's a classic battle of the analogies. And the question is, are search engines more like newspaper editors, as Eugene Volokh believes, in which case they'd be afforded full First Amendment protection, or are they more like infrastructure, like radio or cable, where regulation hits a different kind of balancing test? Are they more like action than speech, 
where what the search engine is doing is actually acting rather than speaking? Or are they like professional advisors where they owe some sort of fiduciary duty to the individuals that they ask them questions, uh, even where it's the case that no human relationship arises? So again, going back to the takeaway from this analysis, once again, the First Amendment, its doctrine, its theory, and its constitutional premises leaves surprising space for AI authors and speakers. And that's because, again, the law that the technology encounters does not center on the human identity of the author. Rather, it tends to focus on the nature or genre of the speech or on the speech act. Thus, in my and my co-authors view, Helen Norton and Tony Massaro's, there's no reason why, at least on principle, AI novelists wouldn't be covered or even protected by First Amendment law. And that's because there's been ample room built in over the years in the doctrine for audience and reader interests as well. And as a final thought about the First Amendment, this does have implications, though, for how judges balance interests, including the regulatory interests the government is purporting to advance. And that's because there may be reason under a reader side theory or authors or, or listener side theory of the First Amendment to give more weight to audience and reader and listener interests. So in conclusion, both US copyright law and US First Amendment law leave perhaps surprising, perhaps not surprising at all, room for non-human authors. And this is not because of some inherently disruptive quality of AI. In, in the sense that this is not a story of how emergence as a feature of this technology has broken or outpaced our existing law. What's happening instead is that this technology is being met by or interpreted into a system of meaning of law that constructs authorship in particular ways. In the context of copyright law, a shift from originality towards corporate authorship, and in First Amendment law, a shift toward broader salience, more protection overall, and examination of not just speaker, but reader interests in the context of First Amendment. Thus, it's the features of the law that matter, maybe not more so than the features of the technology. But when we tell the story of technological disruption that focuses on identifying only what exists in the technology and not what exists already in the law, we miss what's actually happening when we talk about technological disruption. Thus, emergence does not escape the law. It encounters, is interpreted through, and is shaped by the law. And with that, I'll leave it to Professor Lerner's comments and to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lerner. Thank you so much. This was so fun to read and think about. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, great. This was very fun to think about uh, and to read, and I really appreciate your visit here today. So I think I agree that doctrine leaves surprising room for AI and that emergence doesn't shape the law. Instead, it is encountered and shaped by it. Um, and, and that, uh, you know, I think if I understand your, your thesis, a particular feature of a particular technology disrupts the law only because the law has been structured in a way that makes that feature relevant. Uh, and the follow-up question that you would ask that, and that you ask in this paper is, uh, so does doctrinal or theater, or is it doctrinal disruption, theoretical disruption, minor or major? Uh, you could say this is a chicken and egg problem. Does the law influence technology or does technology influence the law? But it seems to me that is not the right question. Rather, copyright law and both and probably other areas and technology have more of a symbiotic relationship than a chicken or an egg problem. Um, the First Amendment is often called the only constitutional provision that bestows constitutional protection on a particular industry, which traditionally revolved around and grew out of and was a response to a singular technology, the printing press. And with copyright, and you refer, you, you definitely talk about this in your paper, um, <clears throat> that copyright is, the history of copyright is sometimes seen as a pacing type of De development, in other words, uh, it, you know, is technology, is the law keeping pace with technology? But I really do think that the history of copyright is a history of congressional responses to technology. And so I think where I would push back a little bit is on the question to which technology, as you put it, is a lens by which to see the law or, or, whether, or whether the law is a series, at least in copyright, but I think all you could say in many other areas, uh, simply responses to technology or responses to developments in, in how humans interact and, and in social patterns or whatever you might say. 
right? So we have provisions in the copyright. You know, if you look at the statute, it reads like it reads like an administrative regulation, right? We have particular provisions related to satellite transmissions. We have particular provisions related to digital audio tape, the Audio Home Recording Act. We have regulations related to jukeboxes and then modifications related, uh, around jukeboxes. Software. Uh, just in three years ago, two and a half years ago, the music, mo feels like 20 years ago, but it was only 2018, the Music Modernization Act was passed, which was a direct response negotiated by industry to uh, a particular type of streaming technology that the law did, had not figured out how to account for, which is the Spotify style individual uh, user selected um, streams. Right. And then you see many fair use decisions, which have which have which have also shaped the law. Sony versus uh, Universal uh, Universal Studios, uh, Sony Betamax, uh, Kelly versus Ariva Soft, dealing with search engines. And you, of course, you talk about search engines in the in the, um, in the context of authorship. Um, and, you know, and then you so, you know, to me, we do see the, the law. And of course, that means the doctrine being shaped very specifically by very specific technologies um, and very explicitly. Um, so Congress, I think, sees copyright law as, and, and as a history of congressional responses to technology to the extent you can say Congress sees anything one way or another. But I would say the text of the copyright statute sees it that way as well. So on the one hand, I would push back against the concept that, uh, that technology is merely a lens by which to see the law. But on the other hand, I think I agree with your fundamental argument, which is to the extent algorithmic authorship disrupts copyright law by, by requiring us to, and I'm quoting here, by requiring us to reassess the concept of the romantic author, that set of issues was already raised around far less complex digital technology. So the question of AI authorship to me is, um, is not necessarily that, I, and I think I agree with you and perhaps, uh, perhaps James Grimmelman, that the question of AI authorship is not necessarily that difficult uh, when it comes to how to uh, handle that from a conceptual standpoint, um, doctrinally. Um, but my view is copyright, and perhaps you could argue incre increasingly the First Amendment law, is heavily influenced by commercial exploitation and industry structures. And we should ask the normative question of whether this is, and you do ask this question, you asked it in your talk today. So I, I'd like to hear more on that question. The normative question, as I see it, is whether this is a good thing, uh, given what kinds of activity is therefore incentivized and rewarded with monopoly rents, even if it's not necessarily incentivized very well. As regards artificial in intelligence, we should ask the same question. What kinds of activity do we want to incentivize? And I'd like to hear more about your views on that. So that's my first question. Uh, a more instrumental version of that question, perhaps, or a more, or, or a more immediate version would be uh, the doctrinal question, does the architect of the AI get any credit, or is it just the artist who uses the tool? And I know that Professor Burke and others are working on this problem, and I think it's a very interesting conversation. And I'd also love to hear how this essay has informed your, your work, which is now uh, three or four years old. Uh, on law and technology disruption more generally and regulating AI. And finally, I just wanted to conclude with a compliment. I was very happy to see, Professor, that you cited, you, you looked at some of the older works around authorship and copyright. Um, so that you cited to a friend, Fred Yen paper from 1998, Professor Justin Hughes from 2005, uh, and, and I've noticed in, in um, a lot of recent scholarship some of some of uh, what people have been some some of what people are saying in recent scholarship sometimes has been said uh, before, but it's sort of been lost to um, contemporary conversation. So I, um, I I love how deeply researched um, and informed this paper was by the scholarship that's come before, among many other things, obviously. Thank you so much. Um, so I can take a couple minutes to answer uh, if that's okay. Yeah. yeah. So first of all, thank you for the compliments. That's always fun. Um, and uh, I wanted to say I, I really did enjoy getting to engage with Professor Burke's article that's related to this or follows from this um, because I both saw it as very different from what I'm doing here and in a way that's you know, fairly uh, understandable through what I'm doing here. And this is in part an answer to your question. Um, so 
Um, so this to, to two of the questions. One, does the author get credit or really when does the, the author of the program get credit? Um, and also, um, you know, Professor Kaminsky, you spend so much time talking about how this isn't disruptive, but then look, all of the regulators are adjusting the law in response to disruptive technologies all the time in copyright law. Um, so Professor Burke's piece in Houston Law Review talks about 36 different scenarios where we can imagine uh, Jackson Pollock or AI Jackson Pollock creating art and how each of these scenarios is actually pretty readily parsable under copyright doctrine. Uh, and he does this through the lens of looking at um, both the way that intent is handled in copyright law and the way that fixation is handled in copyright law. And in some ways, this reminded me of the Grimmelman piece, but it was more specific to those particular doctrinal wrinkles. Um, and so my answer to your does the author get credit question is read that piece um, in part because as you go through, you know, it, it's going to be highly dependent on what the factual scenario is, what the particular AI looks like. And as I mentioned, when I was describing um, algorithms and their design and the human actors around them or the you know human AI assemblage, um, there's a very different set of delegations of tasks to users of AI depending on a particular scenario. So if we think about this, this is not about copyright or First Amendment law at all, but we think about this in the criminal justice context, um, you could get a, a federal judge who is handed an AI that produces a sentence, or you could have a federal judge that's handed an AI that recommends a sentence, or you could have a federal judge handed an AI um, that says, on the basis of these three factors, I'm recommending a range of sentences that you get to choose from. Um, and the those are very different scenarios in terms of what the end user is doing uh, versus how much is you know, sort of landing in the lap of that end user. Um, so my answer is a little unsatisfactorily is that it will be very fact dependent. Um, now to the, the tailoring of copyright law uh, in response to different technological developments. I'm really glad that you asked this because I think that is a great example of the tech disruption narrative effectively being used to perform regulatory arbitrage to create specific regulations for specific technologies. Um, and sometimes that might be necessary. Right? Sometimes there are cases where uh, we say have two buckets in the law and the technology fits into neither of them and it makes sense to create a third bucket. Um, but then we you know, bump up to theory and ask like, are we doing this in service of the theory behind this law? Um, and I think the argument would be with a lot of these developments in copyright law and it's sort of statutory never ending listness. That's um, not done you know, really to further net social welfare. It's often done in response to some particular form of political capture uh, that is using, harnessing this tech disruption pacing problem narrative to get to a particular substantive result. Um, and so this brings me a little bit to what I've been thinking about, about law and disruption more broadly speaking. Um, and I think that a lot of this is already there in the literature, so I don't want to overclaim. You know, there's the main boogeyman here or straw man here is the pacing problem, the idea that whenever a techno there's a new technology and it gets adopted and used, the law isn't able to keep up with that. And that usually leads uh, outside of the copyright context to a deregulatory argument or a please don't regulate us argument in the US at least. In Europe, it's a very different story. Um, but we know that law can actually structure technology. Um, it can structure technological development either by putting in place bans of particular activities or putting in place incentives towards particular activities. Um, and that the law can also, uh, as I illustrate in this paper, play a role in interpreting technology into long existing norms. So here to make this more concrete, I'm thinking of uh, Bill McGovern's work on cybersecurity and, and reasonableness. And this idea that you know there had been pushback against uh, the FTC using section five to go after unfair uh, cybersecurity practices. And McGovern points out, look, this is just an assessment of do you have reasonable cybersecurity? Um, and that's something that, you know, historically we have tons of reasonableness standards in the law and you don't need to be deregulated here. You can look at what the industry standard is and other forms of regulatory guidance and the law is adapting just fine, thank you. Um, so, uh, so this is part of that project. Um, there are additional pieces that I'm still working on. Uh, so one piece is, um, which I'm actually gonna be talking about a little bit this Thursday at a memorial for the great late Joel Reidenberg, um, is to talk about how technology changes what Balkan and Siegel called an imagined regulatory scene. So that's where um, you, know, you think of your, 
your sort of paradigmatic uh, copyright example, this is also why I love Burke's and Grimmelman's work on imagining different fact patterns, right? Um, your paradigmatic copyright example is the lone human author having a spark of genius and then fixing it on paper. Um, but as technology enters into reality, as the use of technology enters into reality, the way we imagine what it is that we're regulating changes. Um, and there, you know, if you come to the idea that law is one regulatory force, norms are a regulatory force, um, uh, market as a regulatory force, et cetera, then you can think about technology as the architecture that's doing regulating or removing forces of regulation, and the law might actually have to recalibrate its equilibrium to get at the same policy results. Um, so that's one piece of this I'm working on. Uh, and the the second sort of bigger piece is, and then what, right? Like, what are, what are the lessons when you're talking about regulating law and tech? Um, and uh, Rebecca Krutoff and BJ Art have a fantastic article where they start to do that and they're working on a project on this. Um, and I've similarly been thinking about this in the context of how do we design a good regulatory system for regulating AI more broadly speaking. And a lot of the lessons of you know uh, institutional design and collaborative governance versus top-down governance and you know how you tweak the institutions, um, that's a lot of where my head is at when I'm thinking about regulating AI now. I, 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 I'm glad you brought up Professor Reidenberg because I was thinking a lot about his work as I was reading this and it reminded me of his work. And I think it's a wonderful contrast between, you know, how he's saying, okay, you have law, norms, markets, and they sort of squeeze each other like a balloon and have this interaction. And you're saying, well, there maybe there's a different paradigm. So thank you. I, I don't want to um, take up any more of the time. I'm sure there are lots of questions in the queue, but thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yes, we want to invite uh, questions from our, our listeners. Uh, again, there is a Q&A channel uh, where you can post your question. Uh, and while that's, uh, that's getting going, I'm going to seize the moderator's prerogative and ask a question uh, or two of my own. So, uh, uh, Professor Kaminsky, you, you mentioned Rebecca Crudoff a moment ago. She was one of our previous uh, speakers this semester in the series. And um, uh, was very interested to hear her present some of her work and talk about uh, how her goal in, in what she's writing, what she's working on, is to position herself um, within a certain uh, dialogue or a certain conversation, uh, in, in her case, with regard to the, the law of war and autonomous weapon systems. Um, uh, and, and one of the things we learned from her was, you know, that she's uh, trying to position herself in between a, a sort of a, a group that uh, advocates um, a totally new law to deal with uh, the, uh, the issues that are being raised uh, by autonomous weapon systems, uh, and another group uh, that says, no, no, everything is fine. We can just use the law that we already have. We don't need anything new. Uh, and she's sort of sticking out of middle ground. So you've, you've mentioned a couple of times uh, and, and alluded uh, in, in your presentation to uh, the conversations that are going on in your area. Uh, and I'm starting to get a sense of, of, of the ground that you're trying to stake out. But could you, could you say more uh, for the readers about, you know, sort of, of where you're trying to position yourself in this conversation about disruption and and kind of who the who the actors are uh, in the conversation uh, regarding law and technology about disruptive influences. Absolutely. So um, this actually comes from a conversation that was happening. It started a number of years ago, hence this article being written in 2016, 17, <laughs> um, where Ryan Kahlo of University of Washington came out with a piece on the law of robotics and started with the technology. Um, and I want to say there's a lot about Professor Kahlo's work that I deeply respect um, and also disagree with. So he started by saying, you know, let's imagine the robot, right? And let's say, what is it about the robot that's going to disrupt the law? Um, which is a little bit of the law of the horse question. It's the, I'm making the case for the fact that there should be robotics law. Um, and I think what's interesting about this is that a number of us read that, responded to it in slightly different ways. Um, Rebecca Krutoff was one of them. Meg Jones, again, was another one. Balkan Jack Balkan responded to this too, to say, wait a second, what are you doing starting from the technology in a vacuum? Um, you know, what, what happens when you're looking at, at technologies and, and legal ad adaptation to them um, is that you know, sometimes, and here I'm thinking actually like an old Pam Samuelson piece, um, sometimes the law is just fine, 
right? The law, like antitrust law is antitrust law. The fact that it was Microsoft that was violating antitrust law uh, makes close to no difference to how the law is applied. Um, and so I think what it, what that article in the responses to it did um, was spark an interest for a number of, of academics in trying to figure out, well, there is something there in the discussion of tech law writ broad. I mean, all of us are teaching it um, and writing in it and I identify as a tech law academic. So it's not like I think it's an empty concept. Um, and at the same time, I react very strongly to, um, to the idea that, uh, you know, there are a thousand, by way more than a thousand, there are millions of articles written um, for the popular press that start with the premise that there is a particular tech and the law can't figure out what to do with it. Um, and to Professor Krutoff's point, uh, often the argument isn't, can the law figure out what to do with it? But normatively, whose side am I on? Um, normatively, what do I think the law should be doing? And it may be that I normatively think the law should do a certain thing and therefore I think we shouldn't change it or that I normatively think the law should do a different thing and therefore I definitely think we should change it. Um, and that's really you know, the crux of the question more so than what is the feature of the technology that's gonna encounter an area of the law. I wanna give one concrete example because I know that helps. So um, one of the things that Kalo identified in his work on, on robotics was that um, it presents an interesting question with respect to tort liability. I'm not a tort scholar, so I don't want to go too far on a limb here. Um, but the question is, you know, we've we've created safe harbors famously for information technology in the context of CDA 230, uh, the Section 230 of the Commun Communications Decency Act, um, and done so with the idea that we want to enable open platforms uh, with little censorship slash moderation by um, the platforms that are you know, hosting all of these users. And Kalo made a similar argument with respect to robotics um, saying, you know, it's dangerous if we don't create a similar safe harbor uh, with respect to robotic development, you're gonna end up with all of these closed systems and it'll be the death of generativity in robotics law. Um, now, what was interesting about that is that, uh, that um, uh, <laughs> when Meg Jones looked at this and she has a comparative law background like I do, she said, well, that's funny because that's not how European countries treat the internet at all. Um, they don't have a safe harbor for these internet platforms. And so when you come in and you say, robots disrupt US law because we've created safe harbors for other information technologies and this doesn't seem to quite work the same way, that's presuming a scene that you're arriving at with the technology that is not necessarily how things had to be. Um, so I, I think like every person writing in this field, find myself struggling against uh, the impulse to start each paper with a, this technology is disruptive and that's why I'm writing about it. Um, but I think that's not how it has to be. And we can be thinking more in terms of conversations with other legal academics uh, in other fields about, you know, adjustments of regulatory design and identifying clearly what level you're talking at, doctrine, major doctrine, theory, et cetera. Um, and really we can both be a valid field and not have to stand out all alone. Wow, great. So um, uh, I'm gonna follow on with a, another question. You, uh, you, know, you talk in the paper and you talk in the presentation about uh, sort of romantic authorship in, uh, in copyright and, and then you uh, uh, talk about uh, some parallel kinds of ideas in, in First Amendment law, um, and one of the one of the responses, or at least partial responses to to this piece that uh, that has come out, um, is the uh, recent paper by Karis Craig and Ian Kerr. Uh, again, unfortunately, the, the late Ian Kerr uh, is a, a great voice in our community that uh, uh, we won't hear from. But his his last uh, uh, his last paper was in, in in part a response to to your paper. Um, uh, saying that they're concerned about romanticizing the robot, right? Now, that uh, it's not so much a question as to whether the author uh, was romanticized or whether uh, the speaker in the First Amendment was romanticized, but uh, uh, concerned that uh, the robot or the AI has become romanticized, and again, with a capital R, right? You know, it's in the romantic period, um, uh, by, uh, by treating it in certain ways as a, a genius uh, that, that develops these types of, uh, of systems. Um, so I, I wonder if you if you have a response to that or thoughts to that uh, uh, concern. Do, do you uh, 
Do you get worried about anthropomorphization? I think that's a word uh, of, uh, of the AIs, uh, which I see quite a lot of in, in some of the literature. And um, uh, do you worry about the, the AI being romanticized or do you think that's a, uh, a fair response to what you were concerned about? I think they're absolutely right and that it's not a fair response to my piece, but that's okay. <laughs> um, I'm also really like, I. You know, want to take a moment to say how influenced I have been uh, by Ian Kerr and how much of a loss that was to our community and to me personally. Um, so, uh, so I think that they're absolutely right in identifying that an AI is not, you know, a person, um, and an AI is not uh, basically once again the technology in the vacuum. Um, so, with that, I completely agree. And when you go to what the development of um, discussions about fairness and anti-discrimination policies and algorithmic accountability, uh, you see a push, a similar push from a number of authors about this exact issue. Um, and I'm thinking most concretely of work by Andrew Selbst and Dana Boyd, um, where they talk about fairness and socio-technical systems. And they point out that the conversation around discrimination by AI decision makers gets it wrong because we should be looking at the people who build the AI, the uh, environment, the particular setting uh, in which the AI is initially trained, um, the you know sort of organizational infrastructure of the corporation that's around both of those things, um, and then the application and the use of the AI, and all of those humans matter, um, and all of those humans are actually potential points. They don't say this, but potential points for regulatory intervention, um, and uh, and so with that, I I completely agree. And I think they, they were on point with a trend in the literature. Um, now, in terms of how it engages with the work here, I think we were arguing past each other, or maybe they were arguing past me to some extent. Um, because the this piece was sort of more about looking at how imagining AI authors make certain features salient in copyright law um, and in First Amendment law. And that feature is a move away from romantic authorship, not everywhere, um, but in certain contexts that do allow for particular normative outcomes, uh, which brings me full circle back to something that you asked, Jack, that I never answered, um, which is whether I actually like these features of copyright law or First Amendment law. Um, and the answer to that is usually no. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, there's having broadly protective First Amendment law has certain benefits. It also, as we've seen in recent years in applications to campaign finance law um, or deregulatory attempts uh, to use First Amendment law to, to pull down types of regulation, such as data privacy law that uh, many people may think normatively is good, uh, that that kind of broad application is not necessarily a good thing. Um, so what this tells me as an author is that perhaps, uh, you know, playing the intellectual game of talking about tech disruption without being really clear about the normative basis for it can be dangerous. Um, and Ian's piece is wonderful, Ian and Karis's piece is wonderful, and I'm really glad that you brought that up. Yeah. So a uh, question coming up in the chat now from the audience. Um, regarding the First Amendment law, you say that, quote, what should matter is whether the work reads as speech to those who encounter it, end quote. Um, do you see any potential legal or interpretive issues with this statement, perhaps if the audience is an emerging technology too? Uh, that, that's really, I think, two great questions. I mean, the first one I actually wondered about a little bit myself. I assume that you can't mean that statement, uh, that quotation in the strong sense, right? If, if I look at the, uh, you know, the, the landscape of Yosemite or some sand dunes and say, wow, you know, that landscape really speaks to me. It tells me something about uh, my life and the human condition uh, and, and, you know, the humanity's search for meaning. Um, uh, that can't possibly be speech, I don't think, under, under First Amendment law, even if thousands of people agreed with me that it's very meaningful. Right? Um, and then the second question, uh, uh, you know, last week, uh, I, I guess uh, uh, two weeks ago, uh, two, two speakers ago, uh, when we had Rebecca Crudoff here, um, our respondent was our colleague, David Kay, who of course has worked in the uh, area of uh, uh, speech uh, internationally uh, and AI. Uh, and, and one of his projects has had to do with essentially robots censoring robots, right? So we have robots generating text on social media, and then we have uh, platform owners using other robots to take speech down. Um, so does it, does it matter in the First Amendment context uh, if the speakers and the listeners and I guess the censors all happen to be uh, mechanized. So that's kind of two questions. Yeah. yeah, I'll do the second first. So it depends on which theory you have of why the First Amendment should be protective. 
Um, and it depends on, you know, what the engagement is with that particular, uh, you know, listening robot. Um, so I'll take the example that you gave. Uh, I think that absolutely raises a First Amendment problem, at, at least under current doctrine and theory in the U.S. If you have a, um, if if the second, the sensor robot is government mandated, right? Um, because the sensor robot in that case, or sensor AI, um, is removing speech from the marketplace. Uh, much of that speech may be, you know, relevant to democratic self-governance, and it's certainly impinging upon the autonomy of the user to be walloped with terrible internet speech, right? Um, and so, uh, so you know, it's not so much whether there is a robot listener, it's what if all the listeners or all the readers were robots um, or AI? Um, and there I actually think of a different criminal in peace, where uh, he was talking about how copyright law seems to have this giant fair use exception for reading by AI. Um, and I think it's a really interesting question and worth, worth further thought um, of when it might be. So, so there, the idea is that um, if we take a utilitarian view of what, uh, for example, um, you know, libraries are doing when they use some sort of AI to, to parse text to make it available in answer to search, um, the courts have largely been coming out saying that net social welfare is advanced by that kind of technology, and therefore we're going to call that fair use, right? Um, now, you may end up with scenarios where that's not the case, uh, and net social welfare as an, an argument comes out in a different direction. Um, but yeah, great question on the second one. Um, to the first, so I remember the first time that uh, Helen Norton and Tony Massaro presented their paper on free speech and AI at We Robot, there was a wonderful audience member who stood up and said, but my cat tatters speaks to me every day. Um, and, and meant this with that lens of or that sort of, you know, quirk of humor, but it was a real question. Um, and so this is the question about the outer bounds of reader side reception, right, which is both in exists in uh, uh, you know, literary theory and exists to some extent in First Amendment doctrine. Um, and the answer is the doctrine does put some limits on it. Uh, again, the Spence test is the one that most immediately comes to mind. And that's the, when you have symbolic speech, um, there's supposed to be an intent to communicate a particularized message. Now, that has been in some cases sort of watered down. Um, there's a, I think it's Hurley, the Irish parade case where the Supreme Court seems to drop the intent to communicate a particularized message and just looks primarily to is it likely to be understood as a message. And also, uh, as you know, Jackson Pollock is everybody's favorite example. Um, there's a question of really what's the particularized message? Do you always really need to have a particularized message um, for First Amendment doctrine, for example, to apply? Um, and so you know, I'm sorry to provide an unsatisfactory answer, but it depends on how broadly or narrowly the Spence test requirements end up being interpreted. And the bigger question I think is really, are we in a genre of communication that's been accepted as speech, such as, you know, movies or novels, et cetera, um, or are you talking about something that we sort of think of as being outside of the genre of communication? And your example of standing and looking at Yosemite, while perfectly meaningful, um, is not really within what we as a society categorize as a genre of communication. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, we're down to the end of our time, and so we need to wrap up. Uh, again, for those who uh, are looking for CLE credit, uh, there is a link in the chat uh, that you can use to get your forms for CLE. Uh, I appreciate everyone in the audience joining us today, and please uh, uh, join me in a round of virtual applause for uh, Professor Kaminsky and for Professor Lerner for uh, being our presenters today. Uh, and uh, thank you all for joining us this semester for our series on AI and the law.